Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. And here with Steven. What's up, guys? Are you related to the wonderful scientist himself, Stephen Hawking? No, I'm not. I wish I was, but I'm I not. I really no, we just have the same spelling, like Stephen Hawking, Stephen King. We just all have the same spelling. You're in. A, you, you can't, can't do that. that. You can't. You cannot compare yourself to two other Stevens like that, because then that sets unsurmountable expectations upon you to live up to their expectations. Can you create ten thousand leagues under the sea? Uh, no, I have not done that yet. <laughs> yeah, so, I like it. You said I've not done that yet. There's still time. That's like, right. I, I'm pretty sure if you named your kid Elon Musk, he would have like really, really hard expectations to live up with. So you got to pick a basic name. Like who's someone that the guy who made Sham Wow, Vince. There you go. All right, let's go with that. Okay. Well, Steven, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, man? Uh, yeah, my name is Steven. I run a podcast called Dark Stories from the, the Campfire. I also kind of run my own little uh, podcast, little like network. It's called Ophelia Publishing and Postcat Network. Uh, we haven't really published anything yet. We have a couple things in the works, but nothing's really been published yet. So I just have my podcast I've been running. I tell little uh, short story, dark stories, kind of creatures, ghosts, paranormal, that kind of thing. Uh, we just released a new season. Right, the first season was just kind of like little separate little stories, kind of short stories to get you in the mood. The second season is more of an overarching like narrative. So it's going to be the same characters, same plot. So just something a little more ambitious rather than just the same, rather than just like little short fictions here and there. Are you are you doing like when, when it comes to stories, are you doing the main ones? Like everybody talked about Bloody Mary, all these other types of like creepy stories that you would hear like by a campfire or something. Or are you talking about like s exclusive ones that like people probably haven't heard of? Because I feel like we're getting drowned in with a lot of like the same ones. Like person saw a ghost in their mirror and they hung themselves. I'm like, cool. Well, give me some specific like cases. Like I, I remember getting into the paranormal and researching ghost stories like uh, Screaming Jenny, which was this girl that lived by a train tracks and she had been caught on fire and she was running on the train tracks and a train hit her so every time this train goes on this train track around this certain point in the track at a certain time they see this like ball of light they would say that just you know, right. a, a whining scream that just heads right towards the train then it's gone but there's many occasions where that's happened right no i don't those i, mean, I have uh I have some, some opinions on that kind of stuff, but mine's, mine's very, mine are all original. You're not going to find them anywhere else other than my podcast. So, but yeah, I would tend to agree with you. A lot of like the quote unquote, like spooky type stuff, just kind of dwell on the same stories over and over, which are fine if you're into folklore, but I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I kind of need something a little more original, something more new that rather than just a dozen podcasters just telling me about the same like urban legends over plus, and over. Plus is, isn't that the point? Like whenever you went to like a campground and you were on like a trip like that and like someone would pull out a flashlight under their chin and start giving you like a accounting tale of story. Like it, it had this whole thing of like, I've never heard this one before, but then it's like right. now every time it's like talking about like a JFK thing. It's like, yeah, that's interesting, but it's the same thing. I want to hear someone's creativity just go loose on a story. Right. Oh, I absolutely agree. And to use that metaphor even uh, even further, I mean, imagine sitting around a campfire and everyone just tells the same story, but just in different variations. I mean, it's just like, OK, that's that's fine. Maybe one or two are really good. The rest are like, all right, that's fine. I mean, yeah, so. Well, if you're yeah, going like, to create a story or spin a yarn, how do you usually start it? Like, where's where does your brain go immediately? Because like when if I'm going to talk about scary stories in my mind, if I'm creating one, it goes immediately to the sea. I'm a beach guy like, you know, right. and scuba diver, the giant lantern headset, whatever they wear when they go underwater. I'm like, there's got to be like, let's take a trip. A dude's going off a pier and he's scuba diving down there for seashells or wedding rings or whatever the hell people lose in the bay or ocean, whatever. And he comes across cross like this a lot of dead bodies and apparently it's a really big mafia dump where they just kill people off at the end of the pier swimming with the fishes except there's one guy like the guy who cleans the golf balls off the golf course and looks in the pond right, right. there's one dude just pulling out mafia uh hit kills out of the bay i'm like there you go i just made that up that's not actually a bad story actually you got the jules verne kind of reference in there <laughs> with the overhead you got the deep sea diving got some little uh hp lovecraft um some true crime that's not actually a bad little story just off the top of your head uh yeah to begin with to start off stories i kind of just pick out 
whatever's interesting to me. Just kind of anything I want to just kind of write about, any theme that I think is just interesting that worth exploring. And from there, I kind of just de develop a setting and then the characters. And usually the ending is the hardest part. I try to get the ending first, make sure that I have that ending is nailed down very concrete, like I'm comfortable with the ending so that I can make sure I'm doing the outline, I start weaving the information through. So you get to the ending, yeah, it's, it's a twist. But if you go back, it's like it's all signs were pointing to that. So my stories are why they seem, whether you're reading them or listening to them open-ended, they're extremely like linear. Like I'm leading you down a certain corridor, but you're just not aware of it until you get to the end. Okay, That's so kind of so how I construct that stuff. Kind of not like taking the obvious route. Like, you know, there's a hitchhiker on the side of the road and then there's a nun driving by decides to open up the door for the hitchhiker. And it's like, at this point, you already kind of know something bad is about to happen. But then like, right. who says they go to like a Dave and Buster's and he just starts shoot, shooting the shit out of Dave and Buster's. And then the waiter comes over. He's wearing too many buttons. To me, that's a sign of a that's psychopath. A lot of flair. Or, yeah, that's a, that's a lot a, of flair. That's a sign of a psychopath. So I'm like, that guy's going to murder both the hitchhiker yeah. and the nun. I mean, yeah, uh, something along those lines. Yeah, you just, again, yeah, you don't really see. The, the point is you don't see the ending coming, but you kind of should have because it's weaved throughout the, the story itself. So that's, that's yeah, that's kind of how I construct them. Um, that kind of the thing that excites me the most is knowing is after I get the ending done and going through the outlines, like, okay, where can I pick for like little things here and there so that you're reading it, it seems normal within the context of what you're reading, but you don't really understand that it's actually like, again, like leading you down this very specific corridor yeah, until, you, until you're your inevitable end. You don't want to kind of have everyone guessing where it's going to go and kind of being like, all right, well, I know it's going to end up like this. And then it ends up like that. You want them to look at it and be like kind of thrown off by the way it ends up. Does it have an overall message that it plays? Like when you hear most f folklore stuff, it's like Hansel and Gretel was, you know, don't ever fucking accept breadcrumbs from a witch, you know, but like, <laughs> is there an overall message you try and send throughout the story, like a theme or a um, of most of the time? Yes, there is a theme. I there's a theme I definitely want to hit on, and I try to weave that through. But most of the time, it's just again, kind of whatever is interesting, whatever I think maybe scary or spooky or creepy. I don't deal with a lot of like, I, I guess what I would call like modern kind of horror. I don't really get into the gore and the over sexualization and the murder type stuff. I try to keep it more on the lines like more like Victorian kind of kind of kind of feel. What, what about Victorian, though? Because actually one of my little secret, like, uh, smart topics I would know a lot about is actually 19th century Victorian surgery. So I never get to throw that card out at, like, a fucking party or something. Do it. Throw it out uh, there. So I've I, actually written a story about a, a 19th century surgery all right. on how, the podcast. What, all right. What's, what's, if you can give me a quick synopsis of the story. What's the story? I was – I think it was – I want to say it was my Christmas episode. It was kind of a bonus episode. <laughs> It was about, uh, oddly enough, but it actually fits in with the Victorian themes of Christmas storytelling, of Halloween story, uh, not Halloween, but uh, horror storytelling they used to do. Victorians used to tell each other horror stories on Christmas. That was a pastime of theirs. So it kind of fits in with that motif. So you have this surgeon, his young surgeon, he's just been accepted into surgical school. Uh, he's unable to like, make it home one year, but he tells the people back home, oh, I'm just really busy. Um, th then the next year he comes back home, people are excited, but he's really drawn out. He just, he just doesn't know what, if he can do this anymore. And so uh, during, after dinner, they decide to have this seance again, because it was completely normal to the time. And then the seance, this apparition comes, um, it starts pointing towards him. And then of course, the rest of the story, it's a kind of the reveal. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, yeah. See, I don't uh, want to completely spoil it because if no one's listened to it yet. So that's kind of a little it's teaser. Yeah, you have this. You have this surgeon. It deals uh, with with our, our, our turn of the century kind of dissection methods and the pressure that a lot of the surgeons were under. You could have went more real with it and been like germ theory, where like nobody knew about germs back then, so they were just being contaminated left and right. I mean, like, come on. I could have, but it's not. It's not a ghost story. That you can tell me this motherfucker <laughs> can cut a turkey, but he can't cut a person up. Come on now. No, he can cut. No, that's not, uh, again. He can dissect a person. I just don't want to reveal, reveal the endings in case anyone hasn't heard it yet. So that's, that's again. That's kind of like it, it leads you to a certain point. Like you should like see the ending coming. Like when the ghost appears, uh, accuses him of what she does, and then you, it breaks off to another part, and then it leads into the end. 
I'm already thinking it's going down like a Benjamin Franklin route where he's got bodies in the basement that nobody knows about. He's just stealing corpses and stuff. No, no, not at all. Actually, there's no body snatch. I thought about doing the body snatching route. I was like, nah, I want to do something a little, little more, little, little more sinister and a little more shocking. Do you like? pulling out like inspiration like from actual history because i mean that is that was a thing that happened back in the day a lot of people don't know about right. it they used to do like body snatching grave robbing type things and oh yeah it would was... literally there were devices that were made to go over coffins to stop intruders from breaking in and then there are people that were getting so upset that they would dig up their loved one like you're digging up grandma and bringing her home sitting her in the fucking yeah. recliner and watching fucking whatever news is on yeah it was as you know it was an entire industry I and mean, people made livelihoods off of it I, I think there's a couple of movies based off of it. A couple of the, one of the two like famous ones that ended up killing people. I can't remember their names off the hand. They made a couple of movies out of them. There's some stories. Ah, uh, see now, uh, if you were going to ask me about like the medical industry back then, I could give right, you right, right, right. But if it, when it comes to serial killers, unless you're talking about like the Zodiac killer type thing, but I don't even know how far back that goes. There's people now that are like, I think I found the Zodiac killer. I'm like, he, it's been fucking like 200 years man like i'm pretty sure he's fucking dead unless he's figured and out we, the cure not, no not zodiac talk about jack the ripper oh jack the ripper <laughs> that's fucking that's england or something like that right yeah the zodiac wasn't 200 years ago that was in the 60s 70s right dude 9 11 feels like 30 years ago man. <laughs> <laughs> fucking time's flying by quick. If you look back then when they were mailing fucking letters and now we're fucking sending email is the la email is the lack of communication right. nowadays. You know what I mean? Right. Is there a little bit of lag now? No, you're good. Okay. It just it froze for a quick second, but we're right. back on. So now people know it froze. Thank you. <laughs> now supposed to would uh, notice those things, man. You're, you're in the story. The guy doesn't write himself into the story. That would be pretentious. That is true. But people do it all the time. It's actually not too bad. It's you write, you write yourself in your stories and I just call it out. You do, don't you? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, sometimes it's fun to do to pick on like real life scenarios of your own. But do you kill yourself in your stories? That makes it better if you do, because then it's not like, oh, he's not the hero. Like imagine if you wrote a story, and made yourself the guy that's getting all the, the, the women and everything like that. Then it's like, all right, hey, man. Uh, no, I don't. Again, I don't really deal too much with people killing each other in my story. So, no, I don't really kill myself off. It's not me per se. It's not like autobiographical. It's just little certain quirks here and there that I tend to throw at a character. That certain things that could pick up where people be like, oh, this is a piece of Steven. And, you know, you could tell like maybe he's got a certain trait or certain thing and he does. Like for me, I have a giant, I would say, uh, addiction to crushing candy in a bag just fucking crushing one of them not both of them just crushing one like right. i'll just go into walmart in my free time and just crush 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 so that, that could be a trait that, a, that could be a trait a character quite could the have hobby. where people be, will be like hey that's a bit of robbie in that character i uh, no i don't use anything that specific i try to keep it a little more general because i don't want to take it too autobiographical uh, but yeah, I mean, if you really know me, people who have listened to stories, know me, friends have picked up on little things here and there that are actually in the stories. But yeah, it's nothing that actually specific. I didn't know that was that specific. I thought that was kind of a, anybody could crush candy. It's not just a me thing. Don't act like nobody else does it. Come on now. I know there's one dude out there. It's like, I fucking feel you, man. I feel you. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there are 100. <laughs> percent no, I'm gonna start going to like Walmart, start crushing candy, just, dude, just so you don't feel so alone now. The sense of relief that you get, if that keeps me from snapping and shooting a bunch of people, then I'm 100 percent okay with doing that, and I think people should just be all right with that. Like the Walmart employee shouldn't be like, "What the <laughs> fuck's wrong with you?" <laughs> I go to Walmart to the candy section. See nothing but crushed candy everywhere. It's like, well, at least there's no mass shooting, so we're all good. Would you say that Christmas one is probably one of your favorites or is there like a specific one you've created or, you know, besides Victorian era, is there any other routes you lean towards or is that the main one? Um, that's usually the one I go down the most only because when I grew up, I was starting kind of getting into horror. That was one of the genres that I really picked up on fairly quickly. Uh, while, while most of the people like I grew up my generation, even generation before, kind of lean towards more towards Stephen King. He was fine from when I was a teenager, but as I grew up, I guess, I mean, to sound really pretentious, my taste started to get like a little more mature. 
So I started leaning towards like M.R. James or Henry James. It was kind of like uh, Charles Dickens, more of that more ghost story feeling using words rather than just just throwing words on the page, if you know what I mean. Because like, uh, I guess the best example would be Edgar Allan Poe. He really knew how to use words to weave an actual image of what you're looking at and what you're feeling. So that was very much a Victorian feel. So that's kind of what I lean towards. And as I was starting to get in more to the old radio type shows, the suspense and radio, the CBS radio hour, uh, the, like the thirties and forties, I, I gravitated more towards that too. Cause again, you have to use like words and sound effects to, to build this imagery. You couldn't just like watch a screen. It wasn't, they wouldn't, we didn't rely on like shocking words. They wanted you to build a store like in their head with them. Yeah. So that's more towards what I started to lean towards. One of the hardest barriers to break is the one from words to just the imagery that it can make in your mind. And I feel like a lot right. of stories nowadays, especially stuff you read through school, it's kind of very basic wordplay until you start getting into like the British literature of things and you start really seeing like the how much emphasis a word could have either in a speech conversation or just on a page, you know, never more, never more. Anything of those, even those just that large compound of word, especially nowadays where people are like taking down their words by like five or six syllables where it's like going to the store turns into two stores. It's like right. you start to see the English language. I mean, American, whatever you want to call it, get kind of butchered in a way. Like it pisses me off when I get like six emoji texts and I'm like, use your fucking words. Like how many people know what the word boondoggling is? Nobody knows what that word is. Nobody. But it's like, if you, expand your vocabulary out but the world is telling you you can't do that the world is now wanting to censor you and tell you words that you can't say and that's my issue i'm like because then it leads to dumb conversations the dude's like you know what i mean i'm like i do know what you mean but can you like be like do you understand what i'm saying you know i like that it makes it sound like you're a little bit more like you might have a phd a possible phd right no i would i would absolutely agree i think the english language I'm not sure if it's just due to a recent cultural shifts or linguistic shifts or just we, we're in a culture where everything has to be dictated like now, now, now. There just doesn't seem to be a whole lot of patience in writing things out. And I would agree with you definitely with the emoji stuff. I don't use emojis at all specifically for that reason. And people, people have asked me, like, why don't you use like a little smiley face? Like, because I can write. I know how to use my words. So I know how to convey what I want to convey to you. I don't need the, like a dancing lady and a smiling emoji like. That's not, that's just not who I am. Well, the more our words get cut down or turned into what they would call slang or whatever, then it's going to eliminate the usage of the other words that you were kind of taught, the one that would be known as literary terms. And eventually, right. once you stop teaching those, it's going to be like cursive. It's just going to die out. There's a rare part of the population that might know cursive, maybe to sign your signature of your name, but to do full out sentences where it's like, even some people are like, I don't. I can't read your fucking card you sent me. And it's like, well, why can't you? It's just cursive. They stopped teaching it in school. They stopped teaching it in first grade for me. And I was like, you stopped on the letter Z. So the only one I don't know how to do is Z. So I'm like, why don't you just teach that last fucking letter? Like you can Google it now. I'm like, I don't care. They didn't, they didn't bother to teach me in school, but that's completely a whole generation of language that's gone. Same thing with Latin. Very few people speak Latin because they just stopped teaching it. They stopped educating on it. I don't want that to get down to where we're just talking in one quick verbiage where it's like, yo, it's like, all right, why don't you say, Hey man, how's it going? That's a little bit better. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack on that one. Um, so I kind of almost lost my train of I'm, thought. I'm sorry, I pack a loaded punch, I would say. That's a sad. Um, shit, I don't even know where to begin on that. Um, uh, but the, the shortening of the language, I mean, it kind of, it almost, again, it kind of makes sense, I guess, in a way, uh, just because of the, the way that kind of entertainment's going. The way I like Spotify, things have to be shorter in order for people just to get people's attention now. Yeah, I think that's kind of the way a lot of this stuff is going. And even Spotify has kind of forced a lot of artists to shorten songs so they can get more of a payout. I think we're just speeding up things because of our quote unquote like, lack of attention spans. But I don't know if even of lack of attention spans, even the real thing anymore. 
we just are just telling ourselves there's no attention span. It's just instant gratification. Like I think right. it's just years upon years of programming. Like if you really think about it, when you get into like a one on one conversation like we're having, we have a right. more intimate type connection deal with our conversation compared to when people are just at the store. Now it, I, it it's not that it's eliminating the factor of intelligence. It's just eliminating it to the point where there's going to be lack of communication so much more now because people are going to be misunderstanding a way a person's trying to interpret something or the ideals of conversations like this, where people could actually talk and have a full on conversation without things being like how many people nowadays go to have a conversation and they're afraid to say something much like probably I, when I reached out to you, you're probably like, what does this person want from me? What have they seen of mine that I've posted that has made them want to talk to me? It's this kind of like be wary type deal. And it's like, no, legit, like conversation, not a whole lot of people have it anymore. And it's because you never know how a person's going to be. The world's so crazy nowadays. Everything's showing you is hate instead of showing you what the good is. So then you don't know to trust anything. Oh, yeah, I'm sure there's. I'm sure there's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of uh, hesitation on how to approach someone new because you don't really know how they're going to react, especially on especially online. I mean, some people just don't care, especially online. Right when you reach out, when you reach out to someone, just ask them a question. Yeah, I, I can understand because, like, I was the same way. Very hesitant. Like, I'm not really sure who you are. Like, what what are you after? Um, so I think a lot of that probably plays into the way we're constructing language, how we're talking to each other. Another thing that's happening. To, uh, kind of the kind of piggyback off of that is dialects are starting to become a little more like regional. So I mean, people on the West Coast don't necessarily know what people like the East Coast are saying anymore. Only because maybe because we're getting a little more closed off. Maybe because just the way the tweets are set up, with social media is was more regional than the worldwide. That we're starting to like coalesce around our own kind of way of speaking. If that makes any sense. So yeah, we so start building up our own little like 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 slangs and short terms. So, yeah, people in the California, Arizona, the Southwest completely know what each other's saying. But you read something from say like Georgia, even Virginia here, like you, like unless you've lived here or know anyone, like you probably have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. So I mean, I have gotten into like a few misunderstandings with people from the West Coast, but it, it, when it's over a conversation, it's understandable, but trying to send it through text, just everybody texts different. It's like somehow dialogue has transferred onto just instant messaging and text and stuff like that. And that really sucks because when you're trying to cut down your words to make it like the fastest message you can possibly send, next thing you know, it just hits this thing where it's like, yeah, I think this person is calling me something. It's like, are they calling you something? Or are they thinking that in a different way because they're from the East Coast and maybe that's a that's a nickname for people. But you're like, no, asshole means asshole. It doesn't mean anything right, else. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, asshole is like the same connotation anywhere. Yeah. There's, there's, there's no real... There's no real uh, vagueness about that. But yeah, that, I mean, the texting, you know, the rise of the like the more texting type of communication uh, has done quite wonders in how we communicate with each other. I'm not sure if it's because we're just not taught how to properly write anymore. We're just shoved in like to learn English, to learn like English, like literature. So we're not really taught how to construct sentences anymore, how to properly do it. I mean, I went to school, we did. We had to learn how to write essays. I'm not even that old. Um, but we had to learn, like, we learned cursive, we learned how to write sentences, we learned how to write essays and creative stories. Um, so that's kind of the background of that. So I already knew how to do that. But I've, I have noticed a lot of people younger than me, like 10, 15 years younger than me, kind of don't have that background. Like the cursive doesn't so much bother me because I don't use cursive at all anyway. I mean, I can read it, but I don't really use it. Uh, but just how to form, just the simple things, like how to form like an argument. I mean, going through the going through college and getting like degrees, so many people sitting in those. Because my background is edu- uh, academic background in culture anthropology, so seeing all the undergraduates who just don't know how to properly construct like a sentence or even like an argument, just kind of is lost. And I'm not sure if we're just not if that's just not structured anymore in the educational system. Whether just kind of throwing them out there, like, oh, you know what a noun and a verb is, you should be fine. I, mean, I don't. I don't know how much that is playing into it either. Much so you're like you're writing out a text or like an email. You're not really. There's there's no baseline for you to like form an actual writing structure based off of. So you're just kind of mimicking what other thing people are saying in hopes that they understand what's going on. 
well, much like if you study, like you said, cultural and anthropology on the aspect of if you look at all those stories that are being told, it might sound a little bit like fairy tale-ish, but also there's riddled with truth. There is a story right. being told. It's a log of history. It's the importance of recording things down when we started putting pen to paper or we started putting blood to rock, whatever you want to call it, anything that you could track oh, your own history. Nowadays, your history is going to be tracked with the shittiest fucking footprint <laughs> when it comes to the spoken word, unless it's recorded. And even then that might get mixed up sometimes. Time. Some dude's talking about fucking Bigfoot and the people in the future are like, man, they're really obsessed with this hominid ape that's out there. But like somebody writing something down, Um, my brother's fiance is a school teacher. And she was like, look at this paper. And I was like, look it over. I was like, what's wrong with it? They're like, I'm, I was I was an F kid. So I would knew right. like, yeah, screw it. I'm like, give the kid a break. And I'm looking at it. And instead of um, like everything was written in like emoji text, like they were writing it out. It was G2G was certain words they were replacing with, which was something you would text it. And I'm like, oh, they text so much that that's now becoming right. the dominant language when they write. So instead of crafting out the actual words, you could look through it and be like, there's so many spelling errors because they're cutting it down the sentences. I was like, the whole point of doing essays in school was to make a lot of fucking words in there. So it would take up more of the page. You could have a really, like, at least that was my trick to get through it was like, <laughs> the fucking sentence with the word count, right. Yeah, the word count. Beat the word count. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure which is like more harmful than the other. The people are just so used to like texting, so when they have to actually write something coherent, they just they just don't know how, or they think that's actually coherent because yeah, their their friends on Twitter knows what it means, but a, lar a larger, more educated audience. Uh, is looking at that like I don't understand what any of this is. Yeah. I, mean, I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not even sure how that gets you through any kind of like degrees or university. That seems kind of odd. Like I've never encountered like anything like that in in a uh, writing student or reading students papers, but. That's, yeah, that seems that seems odd. I'm not I'm not sure what to say about that. It's like um when I I had to take a in my art history class I had to go when I was in college I had to go and take we had to take a field trip and I bailed out of the field trip because I did not feel like going I just wanted to stay home I didn't feel like traveling four hours away which to me now that I look back on it really kind of sucked but it was more of like a money and a time issue I just didn't right. want to spend so. I was like, all right, I'm going to go on my own. And I told him, he was like, all right, yeah, just write a paper, take like your parent with you or something. So I just went with, I said, I went with a family member, but I didn't, I just sat in my room. I looked up pictures of the place, Google images, and I was just looking through and I crafted out this fucking essay, dude. And I have the video on my phone of him reading it in front of the whole <laughs> entire class and being like a fucking plus. And I'm like, what did I, and I, I started reading it. And like, even I was reading it to one of like my parents or something. And they were like, when did you go to this? And I was like, I didn't. That's the point. They're like, that's really fucking good writing. And I was like, I, I it's I'm better. I feel like in conversation form, but when I was typing it out, I was like, went and approached this painting. It was Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night, and I went up close to examine the brush strokes, and I just was tossing in every fucking large word I could possibly think of, and it came out in this way where it sounded so elegant that like, if you knew me, you knew I didn't actually go. But if you were right. to off of a paper, you're like this guy really fucking he said he went up close examined the brush strokes and looked at the directions that they were and it's like this to me i'm like i can't believe it like even him reading it to me i was like wow like i could tell his bullshit but everyone else was in love with it and it was the idea of inserting bigger words making it right. sound you know more extravagant than it actually was to make it have more of an impact that people could create that imagery in their heads rather than saying I walked my dog. All right. Well, you walked your dog. Well, did what was, was the walk? Was the walk brisk? Was the walk something? Even that small little detail impacts it so much. Oh no, I completely agree, and that's kind of rounding back to what we were like originally talking about. I mean, yeah, all those little like just small little details, like little adjectives, adverb, yeah, you know, completely changes like the entire meaning of a sentence. I mean, for good or ill. I mean, just like you said, just adding like briskly, like oh, now whoever you're talking to has a better idea like oh you weren't just meandering across the street you were walking briskly with your dog so it gives a little bit more like a like a nuance to what to what you're actually saying maybe that's kind of what we're talking about like, like the nuance of everything is just kind of like lost its meaning like irony and nuance just don't have much of a place anymore like human and like, like texting like person-to-person communication anymore
You're like, I don't want to go into a store and then say a word like uh, Petrichor or something. And someone will be like, what the fuck did you just call me? And be like, Petrichor, man. Like, you know, I, I want someone to – like, for me, like, I was creating a shirt, for instance, and it was uh, my face uh, or my logo on a quarter. And I was going to put it on the shirt. And it says the name of the podcast, and under it, it was going to say – um something it was going to say latin for conversation which was like corrib- something i can't even remember what it was but i sent that and i was like would this one be better or would i just put podcast under it so people know more what a podcast is over the latin word for conversation they're like yeah you should just put the podcast one because not a lot of people are going to know what that word is and i'm like that's the fucking point when you looked on the back of a quarter and you saw e plurus unum you fucking googled it so you understood that your government wasn't exactly illuminati type stuff in your pocket you know what i mean right but that the fear of nobody's going to want to know what that is on the basis of they don't care enough to look up that information. And I feel like that's just on the influence of if people see a word now or a new word, they don't ask what it is. They just kind of ignore it and go on with the thing. It's like, I would ask what that word is. Cause I want to expand my knowledge on the concept of use larger words. You sound more fucking intelligent. I've gotten through many conversations with PhD people on that aspect. Um. Yeah, I don't. I mean that that is I'll, that is very true. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't. I think it, a lot of it comes down to just people not being intellectually curious anymore. I don't really want to open up. I mean, that's a huge Pandora box to, just to open it. What is like intellectual curiosity like to begin with? But yeah, I mean, even from from my perspective, perspective. It just seems as though that that intellectual curiosity of wanting to look something up or trying to understand like what's actually just, just basically what's going around you just doesn't seem to be taking place very much anymore. Like, cause I write, um, cause I write my stories. They're very specific and they're very uh, environmental and style specific. So if you understand like what I'm doing, you absolutely love it. But, uh, but a newcomer who, does, who has not read any of that, not, they like horror but not the whore that I'm writing aren't, isn't going to take time. Like, okay, what style, why is he using the style he's using and the imagery he's using to make a better effect? A lot of people I've heard are just looking like, well, there's no blood and gore. It's like, well, no, because the style that I'm using doesn't use that. So if you want blood and gore, that's fine. There's more than enough horror stories, horror writers out there that do that more, more power to them. But the, the way I'm using it is very specific style. So yeah, if you aren't going to take the time, again, to have the patience and the intellectual curiosity to figure out like what's actually going on in these stories, yeah, the, you're just going to be completely lost. I think but, that- Yeah, I mean, I would absolutely agree. Like using the Latin term, yeah, it's unfortunate because it'd actually be really cool if you had the podcast and you had that, that yeah. done there. People are like, oh, is that me? Like, oh, that's really, that's, that's smart. That's a good marketing. A lot of people are just going to be like, I don't know what that means. Just kind of move on. Yeah, it's- I think that's part and parcel maybe with the fact of like media as well too. Like everything movie we see now is like somebody getting their head chopped off or something like, or he shit down his throat, like something ridiculous like that. When it's like, I'm a big M night Shyamalan fan because I really love how he writes things in and it kind of leads back into the beginning. I think science is probably one of my all time favorite movies, but like people are like, where's the, where's the action? Where's the suspense? I'm like the fact that if you can actually watch it, you can feel the suspense and even the moments when they're not right. showing you a monster. I mean, they're fe- they're scaring you without actually giving you all the details like old school movies used to be old school werewolf movies right. you would you would hear the transformation but you would never see the monster it would just be a dude face getting like him turning like he's having sex or something on the aspect of like you just heard this werewolf screeching and it gave you that that scared you and you didn't need to see the werewolf but now it's like if you don't see the fucking monster if the monster doesn't rip somebody's head off and eat the head then you're not really scared anymore and i just think that's an aspect of like we've focused way more on instead of the story just the blood and gore or those quick action scenes it's like when you're a kid and you're like does the movie have explosions in it it does have explosions and it's actually every five seconds an explosion (laughs) No, I would, yeah, I would 100% agree. I love those old universal dark stories, dark universe. But yeah, some of my favorite movies are those like The the Mummy, Dracula. Yeah, you don't see anything. It's all about the atmosphere and what kind of the subtext of what's going on. So yeah, I mean, by today's standards, like the the Boris Karloff 1933 Mummy is is kind of boring, kind of doesn't know what's going on. But if you actually like look at it for what it is, it's, it's a really terrific and scary movie. In fact, Frankenstein... Uh, there's, a, there's an old ag- anecdote with a Frankenstein movie that someone had seen it 
And they were so terrified out of their wits, uh, they ended up calling the movie theater manager and said, that movie scared me so much. So I'm going to call you every hour on the hour just to make sure that you don't sleep because neither am I. And like, that's how crazy scary these movies were to them. But yeah, now it's like, it has to be so extreme and so gory that it just, yeah, I don't, it just, just doesn't, just well, doesn't it, it right. pushes the boundaries of things too. Like now chopping somebody's head off is the norm. And even then that doesn't scare people. Now people right. want something more serious, like that cuties thing that was on Netflix. I think that scared more people than anything, you know, like that whole aspect, that, like, <laughs> that was insane <laughs> that that was on there, but now they're making a movie based on COVID based on like it was called COVID-20 or something like that. And it's like, that's how far it's pushing to now scaring people is we're pulling real events and then going, what if? And then fucking taking it down this long road of like government coming to your house and shooting you in your home. I'm like, yo, that's like making a 9-11 movie right after 9-11. Take a chill pill. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's way too, that's way too soon. I don't think, I don't think that's appropriate right now. People are still, yeah, people are still suffering on that. Yeah, that's that's not appropriate. That's what I'm saying. It's it's pushing the boundary of things. Next, it's going to be like some dude. Uh, oh, he directed this. He directed this film about his grandmother dying right after she actually she was still dying at the time. And I'm like, bro, it's like, is that the that what people are going to be expecting now? Because like, I think Bird Box had real real opportunity to turn it into something, but that's the movie I always kind of make it as like that's a very shitty movie. Just on the right. concept of I don't like Sandra Bullock. But the guy I was talking to where I used that movie as a shitty reference, he was like, my buddy wrote that uh, book, so be careful. And I'm like, I bet the book's fucking terrific because you could put that in book form. The fact of including so many details and so many examples where it's like you're not actually seeing the monster attack, but you have to keep your fucking eyes closed. And if you open them, the fear that this thing could murder you, like, oh, uh, like that's fear in itself if you're reading that. But the way the fucking movie did it was like, we're going to sit in a fucking kayak for four hours, go down a fucking waterfall while Sandra Bullock just has resting bitch face constantly. And I couldn't get past that. So I was like, that's that's why it's a bad example. And I think that's because that movie could have been good. But the fact that every movie nowadays and the movies that were even in the box office when that one was uh, coming in, they were all showing monsters and showing people get sliced in half like Michael Myers and shit. That movie just it, it didn't fit for what we're all kind of wanting to see out of a movie. It's better in book form, right? I mean, that's that I would think. I think that's the stark difference between, say, like a, a storytelling that you're writing and storytelling that you're visualizing. So yeah, in like the the say the bird box in written form, that's probably a better way to present that story because again, just like the audience, everyone else is blind to what's going on. Like you don't know what's going on. So when you start shifting that to more visual form, like people kind of now want to see what's going on. They don't want to be left in the dark. So you're trying to leave people in the dark without leaving them in the dark. And I don't think for that movie in particular, because I only got halfway through that movie. I just thought, I just thought it was boring. It just, Thank you. Thank you. Way, way too many plot holes. I just cannot get over like the entire premise. It's just like, this doesn't, this doesn't even make sense. Only because the way they were pulling everything off was like, I don't, I don't, the, I don't buy this. The, I don't buy this for a second. The first five minutes was really good, but then once everybody stopped walking into traffic and shit, I was, it was, I was out of it. Right. It was like the conceptually, it's like really interesting. But yeah, when you start seeing in visual form, like, no, I'm done. I can't, I can't do this. What would impact you more? Seeing like somebody get picked up by an invisible creature or something, and then it cuts away without showing you the actual thing? Or what if you were reading a certain segment in the book that said the man in fear of opening up his eyes out of curiosity took a piece of glass and slowly shredded through his eyes? I think that has way more fucking impact reading that than seeing it on fucking screen. I'd be like, yo, this dude straight up, because that just gives your mind cause to think cause to imagine cause to create that scenario in your head where you start picturing the person that was the blind guy whatever ethnicity he is whatever uh, traits that he has based on something right. you've seen or you've connected to which i think is important a lot of people don't take in they think it's going to be this templated person each person could think of a new character to fit that can envision themselves as that character could do something that's why uh spider-man for instance the reason why um he might have been peter parker and everything but stan lee kind of kept him closed up with the costume was so that any kid no matter what your ethnicity was could envision themselves in that character right and that's kind of the 
the the the the best thing about written the written horror rather than just visual is that if you're right if you're reading it it forces you go to go to an area that you wouldn't normally go to if you're just looking at screen it's very like ephemeral like oh you see it it's disgusting but you kind of walk away like it maybe affects you but chances are it's just not it's just something gory when you're actually reading something much like the the mask the mass uh, analogy, the mass metaphor, the Spider-Man, like it, t- it forces you to kind of go somewhere that you wouldn't necessarily want to go or make you feel uncomfortable. And really good storytelling will make you like feel it much, much later rather than, yeah, because Michael Myers, again, I have to, I love the Halloween movies. They're my favorite franchise. I have a soft spot for slasher movies. I don't know why. I just, I have a friend of mine. All we do is sit around and talk about slasher movies. But yeah, I mean, sometimes it gets a little over the top. But I mean, but we enjoy it. But the, for the story writing process, the written word definitely forces you to go somewhere that you wouldn't normally go to, and then I think that gets lost in the visual storytelling. Yeah, especially for Bird Box. I mean, the the example I would use rather than Bird Box is like visual versus non-visual is Cloverfield. I thought Cloverfield was a f- fairly well done, like found footage, the alien whatnot. I thought it was really well done, uh, suspenseful. You don't see anything until the very end. I kind of was disappointed that they decided to show the alien at the end, rather this thing just walking across the city. They're underground. You don't really know what's attacking them. I thought that was more effective way of storytelling and the chaos and what was going on and leading the the narrative and the the characters down the path. Rather than at the end, you see like, you just see the aliens. Like it's kind of, took a lot of the fear out because now you're not like with them you're just outside you're just watching this world from outside point of view and it's, it was kind of disappointing kind of like um i think the anticipation a lot of times for horror movies is what i like to get scared off of rather than because it seems like when it shows you the actual thing it's like the whole point of michael myers was when that fucking crazy song starts playing and it's right. like oh my god and you're like where's he gonna come from and the next thing you know he comes around the corner and throws you into a fucking wall you're like yes that's what i like to see like that anticipation right. that build up that scare but then now everything's like like it was scary because it was showing you the this kind of creepy monster clown thing you know it was is kind of anticipation scare i was like where the fuck is this thing at like watching a poltergeist movie or something but then now everything's like let me show you battlefield 1978 you're like that's not fucking that's real fuck off like that's not right. good <laughs> you don't want to see that um yeah the it the new it movies i didn't particularly find good i didn't particularly enjoy them i don't i don't i mean what did you think the first movie was Fine. I haven't seen so any was, of them. Oh, you haven't? No. Uh, I'm just going on the basis of the clown in the sewer looking up. I'm like, that's scary if you're fucking walking by. Well, yeah, again, that because you don't because when you first if you first like you don't know if you don't know the book, when you first see that you see first Pennywise just looking up at this from this from this uh, manhole from the sewer box, looking at this little kid like, oh my god, this is this is not going to end good. Like this happy little clown, like this is not going to end good. But the the issue I have with the the newer ones, it's like you're just kind of boring. They just weren't really scary. Do you think so, that's I mean, because looking, you're? Do you? But do you think that's because the anticipation is kind of went up on like what horror movies should be? Like the bar has kind of been set a little bit higher. Like I don't think anybody can beat Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses. Um, I that to me that's still one of the scariest ones out there. When the dude cuts off the da- uh, dad's face and starts wearing it to a little girl and go, "Who's your daddy?" I remember that shit was just like, "Oh my god!" Like to some people they'd be like, "No, that's horrible. You can't play. That's going to scar children." I'm like, "That's the fucking point of a horror movie." That's supposed to be meant for your kids they're supposed to be meant for adults right and again it's also supposed to take you to that dark place that you don't necessarily want to go it's supposed to make you uncomfortable yeah but yeah sometimes the visual cues is effective like seeing seeing that it's been a long time since i've seen that movie it's a good movie uh yeah so sometimes seeing it's more effective yeah because writing that if you read that in a book it probably come off as kind of comical but yeah but seeing it it's the visceral of it that that in that case it would be far more scarier than anything else but then that's kind of the unique in the whole section of just like horror like just really horror folklore and all that in general again it's kind of just forces you to experience something you wouldn't normally experience in the real world it's kind of in a safe capacity like no one obviously wants to be uh generally speaking no one wants to be stalked by a serial killer that's just not something you want to do but to me to play with that kind of play i know there are certain sub genres or some people 
who would probably wouldn't mind. Yeah. But overall, generally speaking, we kind of just want to live our safe little lives. We don't need people stalking us. So, so it does allow you to explore those kind of like scary moments in a very safe environment. What is your uh, nightmare scenario? Like, have you ever had like a really bad nightmare? That's kind of like, holy shit. Like what's your fear scenario? Uh, oh my, I can't remember the last time I have, I've had a nightmare. Uh, I don't know. That's a tough one. I don't really have like a nightmare scenario. I had a nightmare the other day and I never have dreams. I just rarely sleep, but I, whenever I do sleep, it's like deep sleep for like 20 minutes, but it feels like 10 hours, dude, fucking it's one of those dreams where you don't have any strength, you know, like you can go to punch something like I'm in a fight or something, but I have right. no punch, like nothing, no power at all. It's like a little stuffed animal hitting you. And I got in a fight with Mike Tyson because I was, I spent like the whole night watching his interviews back in his old fighting days when he was just insane. Have you seen right. any of those? No, I have not seen any of his interviews. No. Oh my, he has a one video where they're introducing Mike. What do you think about the fight preparing for the fight against uh, what's his face? And he goes, I'm going to eat his ass. I'm going to eat his heart through his fucking ass. And he's just going, you're like, Oh my God. And he's just like, he's like, I'm going to eat his children. And I'm like, and it's not like jokingly saying it. It's like, I'm, if I was that fighter, I'd be like, I don't, I don't want to play this game anymore. Like, and it was one of those scenarios. Like if you watch his old videos, he was hypnotized all these things by his coach to be this insane fucking fighter where he was like, I'm going to eat his children. What do you want from me? And then he bites a dude's ear off in the ring. Like, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Woo! Like that's what got me, dude. I was in that dream and I was like, I have no power behind my punches and this psychopath is going to murder me. That would be quite the, the nightmare scenario. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that Mike Tyson coming after you trying to like eat your children. That would be just the be fact that there's a recorded interview where like, who, who, how do you talk to that guy afterwards? Be like, Hey man, I know you have a weed farm now, but how do you explain <laughs> saying this? I was just crazy. You know, I was just nuts. I had one of them <laughs> twisted T's to the face. That comes from a baby voice, too. That even makes it even more haunting. It's not like it's this big, brutal guy like Tang. It's like this little baby Mal telling you I was going to eat your, like, your heart and your children. Like, yeah, that's really insane. That's, that's not fun at all. That's a guy who has great speech crafting because in his speech, he was like, he's no winner. I'm Alexander the Great. I'm the, and he just started going, nobody can even pale in comparison to me. And you're like, he's got really good syllables and words that he uses. But that fucking speech impediment he has kind of really takes the punch out of it. Like, I'm, right. Ale I'm Alexander the Great. And it's like, oh, man, that would have been a great right. fucking speech if you wouldn't have just stuttered on that one. Right. Yeah. If you had Muhammad Ali's voice was saying what he's saying, that would have been a lot more effective. Or at least George wow. Foreman enthusiasm when he says his shit. So it's like it really packing a punch. In right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, dude, oh. That, that, that that's my nightmare <laughs> scenario. But I mean, like a really good movie I always like to talk about that people don't really like is The Happening. But have you seen The Visit with M. Night Shyamalan? Uh, yeah, I have. Um as a, as a movie, if you don't, okay, with the M. Night Shyamalan, if you don't really think about what's going on, it's it's a fairly effective, scary movie. It wasn't scary until halfway in because you find out the grandparents aren't the grandparents, and that's where I right. was hooked. No, that, that, towards, the, towards the middle, yeah, because you don't initially know. You just think the parents or the grandparents are just going are just losing it essentially. Yeah. I thought in the mindset of how many kids found out at the age of like 26, that they were adopted and those grandparents weren't actually their grandparents. They were like, Oh my God, I can relate to this. I thought that was my actual grandma. And she just told me, no, I'm not your fucking grandma. I'm your adopted grandma. You're like, Oh, I don't actually love you. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, that just goes so bad. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, it was one of those things. Like, if you really think about it, only because the people don't really talk naturally in that movie. It's it's all covered in like vagueness, and when they show up to, looking for their grandparents, they're kind of like vague as to why they're looking for them. It's like you just see like because really, if you rewatch, like like no one talks this way. Like, you don't go up to someone's door like I'm looking for your grandfather. Like why? Oh, uh, you, you know, just let them know I'm look, I'm just looking for them. like, not like hey, we had two people just escape from the asylum. We want to make sure everything's okay. Like, can I talk to your grandpa just to make sure they're safe? It just it just seemed like very odd 
the way things are like just spoken, the way it's presented. So yeah, just on a, on a movie itself, it was, it was enjoyable. But yeah, once you start thinking about it, like none of this would make sense. They would, the kids would have found out like right away that that's not, that's not their grandparents. They fucking fooled me halfway through that. I was just like, yeah, this <laughs> woman is naked and she is scratching a door. And then I'm like, that's what got me. And then when you find out they're not the grandparents, I was like, oh, but I was like, how did the mom be so neglectful towards the kid? I was like, that was my right. big thing was like, you don't fucking right. walk your kids up to the house and talk to them. You would know if that's your grandparents or not. Right. Exactly. Say. It's just one of those things like, like it just doesn't make sense. It's only happening for the plot to happen. Uh, I think the scariest moment, it kind of reminded me like later of the res the new Resident Evil movie, not a movie with it, the game where the grandmother's underneath the house and starts crawling towards her. That kind of reminded me of like the Marguerite and the, the 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 new Resident Evil movie where she's chasing you around that barn and you gotta like torture, like, oh my god, now that now that would be something terrifying. You're just hanging underneath your house and this old lady starts like crab walking towards you. Like that would be a nightmare scenario right there. Kind of like my biggest fear if, if like the paranormal or all that, like if I was haunted by a ghost would be that little, like, if you ever seen scary movie four where no, it's like, it's, it's like world of the worlds or whatever. And they have that uh one, it's like a mix of saw in there as well, but there's that little like Chinese ghost kid. And he's sitting on top of the thing. He's like pale blue because he was drowned in a bathtub. And he's like, Ente, ente. and every time I walk in my house and I have stairs at my house to have those little wooden bars, when it's like night, I'll look up and I'll be like, I swear to God, like that, that dude's fucking linked to me. Like one of those types of things. <laughs> like when you see cabin in the woods or whatever, and it's like, all right. you see all the kids in the Chinese camera that are all hugging or holding hands and you see that they failed. And this ghost is like turning into a frog. That ghost, <laughs> that motherfucker with the really long <laughs> rudge like hair scares the living shit out of me. So like late at night, you just you feel something in your bed, you lift up the sheet, she's looking back at you. That'd no, be- first of all, <laughs> covers are our protector, covers are our savior. But sometimes I'm laying down in my bed and I'll look under the crack of my door and there'll be like a light on in the hallway and I just see something walk by and I'm like, there's nobody in my fucking house right now. I don't know if it's my brain doing that, but I open up the door and I like walk out there. I'm like, if I call out to it and threaten it, maybe it'll go away. But I put on like a deep manly voice where I'm like, y'all mo- <laughs> motherfuckers about to get your ass kicked if you come in there and scare me one more time. You know, but like that's not, that's my biggest fear is like if people talk about demons being linked to you, I'm like, yo, I know I got that little grudge motherfucker that is linked to me because <laughs> that's just that's my definition of hell right there is if this little Chinese boy just comes out and goes. Kanta, yes, whatever he says, it just scares the. Why are you pale? What? Nobody's that pale. <laughs> like it doesn't make sense to me, unless you're albino, and even then, you still got some tint to you. Yeah, maybe that's what you got. You got know, an albino child haunting you. That's there. You go. <laughs> <laughs> that's a story, dude. That's a story. That's <laughs> good. You got actually an albino child that's living in your walls. It just comes out and runs around at night. I don't there know why go. that's scarier to me than a regular like toned child. I don't know why albino scares me more. I don't know. Probably because it's just the lack of everything. Lack of pigment. <laughs> lack of color. Stephen, can you just imagine? Just the absence of anything that we would perceive as normal. Can, can, you, can you imagine if somebody came to you and said, Stephen, something is haunting you. And you're like, what is haunting me? You're like, there's, and you find out there's a small child that has worked his way into your walls. And for the past three years, he's been watching you do all your secret dirty things, walk around naked, fucking jack off even. And you're like, so we can get the kid out of the walls for you. You're like, I'll handle it. You're like, why? But we're the police. We can get the kid out of the walls for you. And it's like, this kid has seen everything I've done for the past three years when nobody is here. And I think I'm home alone. That kid's not fucking living. You just burn the fucking house down. Right. <laughs> He's not telling my secret. We could have pulled him out of the walls and brought him to safety. No, no, no. Yeah, you could have. True. Could have. Could have. <laughs> been, everything would have been okay. We, we like to say no survivors on that one. No survivors. Right. Just, yeah, just... Drive away as it burns down. Well, let's get a new house. You let's see somebody with like it. a fire extinguisher come out and start spraying your house. You just go, no, 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 no. Just start putting it down from them. No, right. so, wow, my house yeah. needs to burn. It needs to be clean. Let it do it. Let it let it happen. It's the way it is. And so it shall be. That's right. how you would end it. Right. <laughs> and everyone just kind of ducks their head and goes back to the house. And I drive away. Is anybody get a call 911? No. Um, no. Just let his house burn down. He, right. That's what he wants. He's fine with it. It's like a make a wish kid. You All just right. gotta you just gotta accept it. Right. <laughs> <laughs>
It's all right. <laughs> well, Stephen, where can people find you at, man? Uh, they can find me on on Apple or Spotify. Just look up uh, dark stories from the, the campfire. So, and pretty much any any major place you can find podcast, it's on there. So just dark dark stories from the campfire. Uh, season one and some bonus episodes are up. Uh, I just started season two. I'm about to release season the, the second episode of season two comes out this Wednesday. Um, so that, that's where they can find me for now. I'm working on a website again for the, the publishing the side of it. I'm working on a website now. I just need to get time. Oh. I'll make sure I link it all in the description. And thank you for listening to this episode out of the blank podcast.